My name's Ah, and welcome to this afternoon's talk. My name is William Berg. I'm a historian uh, by training and profession. I'm not here representing any organizational or, or institutional group other than DSA, of which I'm a member. Uh, basically, uh, as far as what you should take from me is um, I'm uh, I'm a middle-aged white guy who looks kind of like a thumb ranting on the internet just from my room filled with books instead of the, the front of a pickup truck. And that's uh, hopefully about as, as seriously as I think one needs to take uh, this talk. And the subject matter um, is a particular elements of Black history, in particular three periods in Sacramento history where the African-American community faced crises and how they were addressed. And the, the name is very general and it really only applies to one of those three eras, but overall the themes of organization resistance are the common threads. So during these three eras, as, as I mentioned, Sacramento black community faced crises really of a of existence of fights for civil rights and fights against injustice. And there's an old saying among history grad students and academics that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And what we mean by that is that sometimes you see a, what looks like a recurring pattern. And sometimes this is simply projection. People see things that look alike and assume that somehow they're connected. So this is by no means an inevitable process where because things happened, these this sort of thing happened 50 years apart before that it has to happen again. Uh, although some of the things that we're going to talk about will sound familiar. And some of them do seem to be happening again, specifically in terms of social shifts and resurgences of racism and responses from communities affected by racism to maintain the, their lives, their existence, uh, self-defense, which ends up inspiring other social movements. And there's no reason to guarantee that. Uh, I really don't believe in the idea of a calculus of history, but we're going to hear really the same story told three times. Uh, the, another fact, common factor in all of these, and again, this is sort of the, the framework that I'm putting onto it uh, as an academic or as, as a historian, is that Typically, there's a first wave that's a little more moderate and tries for more within the system solutions. But as the crisis point is reached, you get another wave of people who are willing to try more radical solutions and, and more dynamic approaches. And that tends to trigger change. And then those groups become part of a, a new paradigm. Uh, I also want to use the, the term agency. Agency means that people are actors in history. And often the way that black history is portrayed is that uh, this unfortunate population was rescued by intervention by white abolitionists or white activists or, or otherwise that were, that were saved. But the way I want to approach it is this is, these are all decision points where the black community took action and organized on their own. And uh, there were often there were white allies and interlocking forces at work, but the, the communities that we're talking about here had agencies and acted on their own in their own, their community's best interests. And those fights often ended up helping others. White allies provided access to power, but often it was a fraught relationship and a, a, a more complex one than, than a, a, a top-down power relationship. And alliances with other communities, other communities of color specifically meant collaborative power because they were being accepted, uh, being threatened by the same forces and were able to resist adding to each other's numbers in a, a moment of solidarity and sometimes a long-term pattern of solidarity. Uh, next is hegemony, the idea of cultural hegemony and the retention and promotion of Black culture. Sharing art and music and community values with the greater community was often met with rejection or by, or by some acceptance by others uh, co-opting. And we see this specifically in, in jazz, for example, where very often in the, the 1920s and 30s, the Black role in inventing the musical form known as jazz was often attributed to Europeans rather than African-Americans. 
and the growing presence of black culture in American culture dissolved to an extent white supremacy and cultural hegemony by introducing this popular new form that people couldn't turn their backs on. Like I said, it was often appropriated, often stolen, but as we get more aware of the, the origins of our, the, our history and, their, and new sources become apparent and easier to find, uh, we can see where things start and, and where things lead. Um, the final element that we'll talk about, especially towards the end, is inspiration and reaction. These movements inspired other people, and that was part of their value and part of the threat they represented to cultural hegemony. And a lot of these names are now very respected. Uh, at the time, often very reviled. And the 1850s and 60s is the first era we're, that we're talking about. And of course, the key issue during that era was the issue of slavery and political section, the South and its tight embrace of slavery and the North and the growing force of capital and the, the conflict between them, these two, essentially two superpowers in one nation. And the West was in some ways separate, in other ways, it kind of became the defining factor. A lot of the political result of westward expansion became, are these going to be free states or slave states? And the black leaders of this era were principally from the South, often escaped from slavery themselves and participants in helping others escape. But they talked about this new westward, ex westward expansion as an opportunity for growth of freedom and the growth of states that, um, that didn't have slavery and, and should never have slavery. And California during the Mexican era already had a black presence, of course. Uh, the, one of the, the last governors of Mexican California was Pio Pico, born uh, uh, California in Los Angeles. But there were also people coming from other parts of the world. Uh, William Liedesdorf, uh, born in the Caribbean, uh, the European father um, and uh, a former slave mother, uh, moved to California and received a land grant in what's now Folsom, Rancho Cordova. And in a lot of ways, he was the, the, the father of Northern California agriculture and agriculture in the Sacramento region. This is later largely credited to John Sutter in a, a partial erasure, erasure, at least, of Liedesdorf. But Sutter was more of a trader. He grew food because you had to grow food to eat. But as far as being more, uh, a more focused agriculturalist, Liedersdorf was really first. Jim Beckworth was an explorer and a traveler. Uh, he discovered the, the past that still bears his name over the Sierra Nevada. And for a while settled in Sacramento at Sutter's Fort. And California was brought into the nation again this this era of is it going to be a free state or a slave state and at the time the idea was that they would split some the one slave state would come in one free state would come in california broke that compromise by coming in as a free state the comp the closest thing to a compromise was the idea that sojourners people passing through for only a short time who were slaveholders uh could keep the human beings they had brought in with their ownership. But if they were staying in California, they had to manumit them. And that became a serious sticking point. And then, as we'll see, a, a number of slave trials happened because uh, there were people being bought and sold in California. And this wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, a lot of the Southerners who came in, mostly through Southern California, the, a lot of settlers from the United States who came to Northern California, to Sacramento and San Francisco, were from the Northeast, from New York, from New England, and they brought those Northeastern values with them. And this, these were not slave states. A lot of the migrants from the South came in through the Great Desert and showed up in Southern California. And there was a lot of talk about turning coming in as two states, North California and South California, and one free and one slave. Uh, but there was more to it than that, that freedom is the Peter Burnett, who had just come down from Oregon, a state that he also helped found, uh, which included in its state con con uh, constitution, um, a law requiring that if you were black and lived in Oregon, you had to subject yourself to a public beating every six months or leave the state. And he wanted to bring that idea to California. He wanted California to be a free state, not because of any hatred of slavery 
but because uh, hatred of, of people of color. He wanted to be whites only. John Bigler, the second governor of California, uh, he may, well, he was the namesake of Bigler Lake. And uh, you may not say, well, where's Bigler Lake? Uh, that's Lake Tahoe today. He lost that name after during the Civil War, it was discovered that he had Southern, Southern sympathies. And so the second governor of California more, more, was more sided with the South. And Jay Neely Johnson was part of the what was called the Know Nothing Party or the, uh, the American Party. And he's the only mem the member of his party to actually get elected, I think, to, to a state office. But they were a late 1850s, principally anti-immigrant party focused on America for people who had already immigrated here. And they were, again, uh, very much like Peter Burnett, anti-slavery only in that they, they didn't want Black people in the, the in their state either. So this was the state of African Americans in California during the gold rush in early California is trapped between people who wanted to enslave them and people who wanted to kick them out of the state. But still, they were here. A small population, about 1% of the population, these dots uh, showing Sacramento's original street map circa 1850, 1860, show where the bulk of Black businesses and the Black population were in what was later called the West End, generally along M Street, now Capitol Avenue or Capitol Mall from oh, about Fifth Street uh, towards the river. Statewide, as I mentioned, there were slaves who were accompanied minors coming through temporarily. And the idea was that if you were going to settle here in California, you'd have to give them up there. But there wasn't really a firm guideline as to what that actually meant and how long you could stay here before you had to set a person free. And in 1851, there was a, a law passed banning testimony by people of color against whites. So if you were black, if you were Chinese, if, you're, if you were a person of color at all, you couldn't testify against whites in court. And so if a, a white man broke into your house and beat you up in front of your entire family, nobody could testify against him unless another white man happened to be there and was willing to testify against the person who attacked you. The Civil Practices Act, also packed in eight, passed in 1851, was regarding the, the, the I mentioned that, that commerce in slaves that happened here in California. But the, there wasn't really, it's, it said nominally it's not allowed, but there wasn't really a mechanism to enforce that um, inadmissibility or the, the sales of human beings in California. And then the fugitive slave law in California was interpreted very often even more strictly than anywhere else in the country. And so if you were a, an escaped slave who managed to make it to California, you still were could, if you, if you were captured, uh, be returned. Or often if you were a, a freed person, you might be captured and sent into slavery. Allies within other communities included the Chinese who were subject to many of the same laws and prejudices. And we're also a, a growing population in California from its very earliest days, from the from the gold rush, and uh, and then later during the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad, which you can see in the background here. And Sacramento, in particular, was the site of the second largest Chinatown in California. Here on I Street, you can see the the, the new state capitol building at Seventh and I in the background, the Chinatown in the foreground, and often, uh, essentially, Chinese and Black populations were shoved into what was considered by whites to be the worst part of town, which is generally along the swamp along I Street. So many of these, the, the folks that we're talking about were, were neighbors. Uh, some of the early community leaders in Q included Daniel Blue, who was the founder of uh, St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest uh, African Methodist congregation on the West Coast, but 1850, 1851, also around 1851, Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood founded a free school for children of color, principally because her own children were rejected at the, the, Sac the newly founded Sacramento schools. But she also let in uh, indigenous people's kids because they were all they had also been turned away. And she ended up basically starting a, 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 this free school. It's a social institution. She so only stayed in Sacramento for a few years later, moving to what later became Oakland with her husband. And J.B. Sanderson, a reverend who had come to California a couple of years earlier, took over. And he went to the Sacramento City Council, uh, to the um, 
the board and the mayor and said, we have this black school that needs public support and uh, it's fully deserving of it. And so we gave it to us. And the response was uh, by this, the, the then city council was, okay, we'll go ahead and get ahead and support this. But the mayor at the time rejected that he basically vetoed the, the measure by saying that, you know, there's Southerners in the city of Sacramento who would be offended by that. And uh, to his credit, uh, one of the members of the, the city board, uh, one uh, fellow by the name of Mark Hopkins, who's well respected amongst the uh, miners and becoming a, a civic leader in Sacramento, essentially was able to overturn that veto because he felt like uh, everybody else was offended by the idea of not funding a school. And uh, like I said, we'll hear more about Hopkins and some of his uh, business associates shortly. There was in the United States at this time, uh, what was called the convention movement, essentially uh, African-American communities in a region or even an entire state would come together to call for their rights. And Sacramento became the host of these conventions, even before California, even before Sacramento was the capital, there were smaller groups like an 1852 petition to repeal the testimony statute. But 1855, Sacramento is a state capital. It's the second largest city in the state. Los Angeles is still maybe about 1,500 people. San Diego is about 500. But Sacramento is around 15,000, and there's maybe 30, 30 or so thousand people in San Francisco at this point. So Northern California is really the, the population center, and Sacramento has just taken the reins as the political hub. So in November 1855, a... Sorry. The first convention took place at the St. Andrew's AME Church, a second in 1856, and then a third at a new church called Salome Baptist or Shiloh Baptist, which was located at uh, 6th and 8th Street in what had previously been a Chinese Baptist church that became Shiloh's first home. And then another at Hackett House, which was owned by the Hackett Brothers, who, which was an early site of African-American political organizing. Uh, Mrs. Flood gave the initial introduction at the, at the uh, first convention. J.B. Sanderson at the second. And both of these, a lot of this, the types of uh, issues that we're talking about, the right of testimony, the fact that people were being kept in bondage in California long past the point where uh, nominally that they were supposed to be manumitted and, uh, and other issues, the idea of, of, of political section and the influence of the South in California, despite the fact that uh, this was supposed to be a free state and was in no way Southern, um, but there were, there were political elements. The, the Democratic Party itself was splitting into two faction, uh, the chivalry, the chivalry faction, which represented the South, the Old South, and the Slavery South, and the Free Soil faction, uh, which represented the North. But there were people who were splitting off from the Republican Party entirely. And the, the, the founders, or I'm sorry, from the Democratic Party entirely, and they found, founded a new party called the Republicans. And uh, they're very different from the Republicans today. This was essentially founded on the idea of it being an anti-slavery party. And the founders here in Sacramento were Cornelius Cole and Edwin Bryant Crocker. If you've been to the Crocker Art Museum, that's his family's legacy to Sacramento. And it's located in the, uh, the, the, the first meeting of the Republicans was located in the Pioneer Church in 1854 and was pelted. Uh, the um, representatives of the Know Nothings, the Native American Party, pelted the church with eggs and firecrackers and said, you lousy black Republicans, you should get out of our state, um, which uh, they didn't. And their first candidate for president was John Fremont, who was an uh, early explorer of, of California and had been here as part of the uh, Mexican-American War, had uh, taken Sutter's Fort, basically by, by not, not by for, force, but by threat of force. And uh, was rep was broadly seen as an American hero and Western expansion, and uh, was also an uh, anti-slavery advocate. And this basically caused a three-way split, where the, there's there's the Northern Free Soil Democrats and the Southern Democrats. 
the Whigs, whose power is rapidly receding, and then this new party, the Republicans. And the way they were portrayed in uh, this political cartoon was as uh, basically as radical leftists. And the, the group that's here in front of Fremont includes uh, a gentleman who's calling for the banning of tobacco and, uh, and animal eating animals and alcohol, uh, basically a, 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 a um, teetotaling vegan. Uh, a woman smoking a cigarette and wearing pants, calling for equal rights for women, and then uh, uh, a um, what was then called a Fourierist, but what we would now maybe we would call a socialist, uh, is the calling for uh, the equal distribution of property, and then uh, getting rid of the institution of marriage, and then uh, the the gentleman with the cross there is a, a Catholic priest. And at the time, Catholicism was still in the 1850s was very much considered a foreign religion. Uh, most of the United States was Protestant and the small populations of, of Catholics there, of course, there were had been some for, from the from the very beginning Catholics in the United States, but they were largely seen as a, a, a dangerous influence uh, more along the lines of the way we, per, we portray Islam today as a foreign religion that bowed to a foreign, uh, a foreign leader in the form of the Pope. And then, of course, uh, uh, a black man calling for equal rights for people of color and the, the sort of caricatures used here are the same sort of thing that you that we see in uh, propaganda of uh, aimed at the left uh, even today and with some of the same players and the assumption was that the, the of by more conservative elements of American politics in the 1850s is this is who this Republican Party represents what they ended up representing was um, at the time, uh, the, the, an increase in liberty and actually taking action uh, from for people who were escaping slavery. And this is, uh, uh, okay, it's not an actual drawing of Archie Lee. I don't think there were any photos of him ever. This stereotype of an escaped slave that was used in newspapers to, uh, to head up public notices about escaped slaves. Um, Archie Lee was born in Mississippi in 1840, and slaveholder Charles Stovall brought him to California in late 1857 and rented Lee out and collected his wages. And he also started a school here in Sacramento. And in January of 1858, Stovall started to get a little worried that Archie was getting ideas and he was hanging out at this place, the Hackett House that I mentioned earlier with uh, Charles Hackett and Charles Parker, who were abolitionists. And so he decided, well, I'm going to take uh, Archie out of the state and Archie said well no I'm staying uh, I and not only that but I really should be free and so um, Hackett had him arrested or I'm sorry Stovall had him arrested and uh, he actually was defended in the, his first trial by Edwin Bryant Crocker who as I mentioned was it was uh, very very early involved in abolition movement when he lived on the east coast he was actually involved indirectly in the underground railroad brought those values here to California with him and when he helped found the California Republican Party. And uh, he was freed because Archie was able to testify. And then I don't, he wasn't able to testify against a white man in court. It still wasn't allowed. But essentially, Crocker made the case that because Stovall had been here for quite a few months and it's had founded a school, he intended the school as a permanent. So he, okay, he's settling in California, right? And so the first decision uh, in January of 1858 was that uh, Archie Lee should be freed. However, Stovall appealed to the state Supreme Court, whose chair was that fellow Peter Burnett that we mentioned earlier, first governor of California and the, the public beating, if you're going to be black in Oregon. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, let's take pity on this poor guy, Stovall. He's new to California. He doesn't understand all law, so we'll very graciously allow him to take his property back to Mississippi with him. Um, right next to him is uh, David Terry, who is another uh, Supreme Court justice at the time, who was also a, a Southerner. And there were actually a whole series of trials, and the, the fourth of which nominally he, would, he was uh, going to be freed, but uh, Stovall tried to sneak Archie out of the state on board a ship called the Orizaba. And he was, it, there were a couple of different reports that I've found. One said, he, oh, they were arrested for kidnapping. Another said that the, the colored convention, the conventions of African-Americans uh, actually formed an armed party that 
took him off the Orizaba, supposedly bankrolled by this woman, Mary Pleasant, who uh, had come from New Orleans, supposedly trained in voodoo by Marie Laveau. She later became very powerful and influential in Sacramento or in San Francisco, but was very involved with Ab the abolition movement with the Underground Railroad, which did extend to California for a time. And supposedly, this is the one thing I haven't been able to confirm, but supposedly she had bankrolled that effort. And the federal court overturned the state Supreme Court ruling. The final argument to United States Commissioner William Penn Johnson was that, oh, he, vi he violated interstate, uh, the, the, the fugitive slave laws, but the federal commissioner said, well, he hadn't crossed state lines. He's still in California, so he hasn't committed any federal crime. So he ended up after multiple trials and multiple parties, both uh, people from the black community and allies fighting to free him. Uh, he actually, uh, Archie did finally go free. He moved to Canada for a while. And then the other thing I haven't been able to verify is he either died in Canada or he returned to California and died here in California near the American River. I mentioned David Broderick, Supreme Court Justice uh, of, of California, and uh, one of the, the turning points is, is kind of the almost a battle that took place is the duel between David Broderick, uh, who's on the right here, and David Terry. And these are both young men. Uh, David Broderick on the right was born in 1820, David Terry in 1823, and this was the 1850s, so they were really only in their 20s and 30s. And... Um, they dueled over what was called the Lecompton Constitution of Kansas. Uh, for those of you who follow American history around the period leading up to the, the, the Civil War, bloody Kansas, Kansas being one of the other major pre-Civil War battlegrounds where there was actually combat taking place and, and small battles that um, this became such a political dispute that these two men, previously good friends, uh, took, took to arms and... Uh, David Terry killed David Broderick uh, outside Lake Merced near San Francisco over the, the issue of slavery and, and over this, this political issue. And so uh, folks like David Terry, were, uh, uh, David Broderick were willing to put their money where their mouth, uh, mouth was. Uh, David Terry actually died. Uh, he was shot in 1889 when he tried to kill a, another Supreme Court justice who had taken his job. Uh, in 1863, during the Civil War, obviously, uh, slaves in slave states were were manumitted and and um, were were freed, and the the right of testimony was actually restored during the Civil War. But after the Civil War, there was a fourth convention of this of this community again in the in the old the old state capital, Seventh and I Street, to say, well, what now? And one of the the what nows, the follow ups to this, this era of tumult in the, in the Civil War was that the Black community in California was still very small, but it had a right to organize and to defend itself. And one of the major movements in the later half of the 19th century for uh, Black men, especially in California, were military and paramilitary organizations. They were, there were other social organizations that got out the vote that did community support of various sorts, uh, churches and the Philomathian Lodge and uh, Masons and other, other fraternal organizations. But the Sacramento Zoolobs were one of multiple armed black militias throughout California. And they functioned, uh, they did function in, in a military role and were available to call out for community defense. But one of their major ish, major roles was um, getting out the vote and traditionally that meant the republican party because this that was the party of lincoln the party of emancipation and now that black men had the right to vote of course women didn't have the right to vote in california until 1910 but this was the social institution that they used to do it as well as uh, maintenance of power and they even marched in the grand procession on october 22nd 1879 with president ulysses grant a civil war general in sacramento and of course, the latter half of the 19th century, post-Civil War, post-abolition of slavery, what was supposed to happen was Reconstruction, the idea of American redress for the crimes of slavery and for the, the people that had hurt the most. And the counter to that came uh, principally in the South, 
but it had repercussions throughout the country. And then so while there were some gains temporarily, many of those gains were lost by in the South, black codes and Jim Crow laws and a uh, clawing back of political power by essentially the, the same slaveholders who went from being slaveholders to being to, to landlords of sharecroppers. And the, the issues kind of society, subsided from public view until the early 20th century. Uh, that is uh, our segue to, to part two. Oh, incidentally, if you have questions during the, the presentation, feel free to, to put them into the chat or just to shout out. I think everybody's microphone works. So if you have a, a question, you can feel free to interrupt me. You can put it into the chat and the moderator will, will interrupt me or we can wait. We should have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the program. But, uh, the leaders of the early 20th century included uh, people, their background was the 19th century, but they, they were introducing America to a new generation of Black leader with uh, a variety of approaches. One of the most popular and well-known is Booker T. Washington, and his advocacy was the idea that if separate but equal is the law of the land, and it was, according to the Supreme Court at that time, then the Black community can best position themselves by being workers by being servants by educating themselves in vocational trades and and trade schools in order to best serve white America and that was Booker T Washington's permission uh, his mission I found um, there's this book the Sacramento story uh, by Sophie Price and apparently Booker T Washington did come to Sacramento at least once to give a talk at the Crocker Art Museum and uh, at the, the Crocker Gallery and later at the home of Harris Weinstock of the Weinstock and Lupin department store but I haven't been able to find independent verification of exactly when that happened I'm kind of trying to track it down uh, then there were also examples like W.D. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP which was not necessarily in the same position as Washington, as, as necessarily the idea of uh, the Black community as, as remaining in a subservient role until it is built up, essentially the, the, the assumption at some point that white America will take them seriously. Uh, du Bois' uh, opinion was, no, you, you kind of need to take us seriously right now. And I mean, not a, not a revolutionary organization, but at the time, a radical organization, and and at the time, taking a stronger view of the, the these rights need to come now because there are existential threats to the black community that were growing. Also, uh, there were women leaders like Ida B. Wells, and then the uh, Marcus Garvey, who uh, took a different role as a separatist. And there had been earlier movements and ideas of uh, moving uh, released slaves to Liberia, and the okay, they they. Their great 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 grandfather may have been from Africa, or grandmother may have been from Africa. But the idea of returning to Africa, the returning black people to Africa by force or by by um, by convenience came around in the mid nineteenth century. But there were also back to Africa proponents within the African American community, and Mark, Marcus Garvey was more more in the that seat uh, but is he wanted to do so by by way of black economic independence and power uh, starting his own black star line shipping line in order to facilitate out migration some of the politics of this era included shifts in the republican party which previously as we mentioned had been the party of african americans that now had the right to vote the party of lincoln but it was splitting because of the, the rise of the white south following the failure, the, 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 not the failure of Reconstruction, but the, the, the destruction of Reconstruction and the rise of the acceptance of racism that was starting to happen in the early 20th century. The Republican Party split into two factions, the Black and Tan faction, which represented African-American interests, as well as the other, other legs of the Republican Party, which was at the very, very time was very much a, a business party, uh, including a, a faction called the Progressives, which were big believers in progress. The idea that we could address the problems of cities through technology, through sanitation, through new design rules and zoning to minimize 
pollution and disease and um, and some other ideas that were a little more poisonous, like eugenics, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the other faction of, of the of Republican politics at the time, in addition to the black and tan faction and the progressives, was what was called the Lily Whites. And uh, it's fairly obvious, but but they're they were looking for in terms of representation, but uh, the Lily Whites wanted to appeal to the Black South and the people who would never vote for the party of Lincoln might vote for, for a Republican party that had divorced itself from the Black civil rights movement. And the, essentially the Lily Whites won. And that this doesn't mean that they were immediately embraced by the Democrats. During this period, the pretty much the, 19 teens really until the 60s there is no political party in the united states that really embraces black civil rights not to any great extent there are factions of the republicans factions of the democrats where there there's some purchase to be found but mostly that the, the, these become uh, everybody uh, the white america and white political power was based very much on racism a lot of this changed with the upheavals of World War I. The labor movements in the United States, uh, in Sacramento, there were plenty of, of labor upheavals, including the, uh, um, oh, the Pullman strike, which even though Pullman was in Illinois, uh, Sacramento as uh, essentially a factory town for Southern Pacific Railroad, it, it really came to a head here. And I really promised uh, the DSA folks on this, at some point, I really am going to do a talk about labor struggles in Sacramento, including the Pullman strike. And then, of course, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, history not repeating itself, but it kind of does. Uh, there was in the 1919-1920, of course, a massive pandemic not only in the United States, but throughout the world, in the influenza pandemic. And by the 19 teens, we're just coming out of it. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of political crises, uh, a lot of the, the America's first red scare, uh, as far as the, a lot of the leftist organizations, the, the Socialist Party, the IWW, had uh, been making inroads in the in political power, partially because of uh, things like the, the earlier uh, labor strikes that I talked about. And there was a conservative reaction to that. And there's also what was called the Red Summer in 1919 and 1920, and which was a nationwide series of riots and attacks and lynchings and murders uh, of African Americans, uh, of black communities and neighborhoods and uh this uh, is uh, it's almost like uh between this and the and the influenza pandemic it's almost like there's this chapter of american history that it seems like it was just forgotten but it wasn't really forgotten so much as just sort of buried uh and we're just starting to hear about this now because we're experiencing what seems like the same the same thing that 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 same tune sounds very familiar to our ears um we're having our own red summer and our own influenza pandemic our own uh labor series of labor struggles following the end of a war and uh a, a new america coming from it in sacramento uh one of the leaders of the african-american community in the early 20th century was robert fletcher who had was born uh, in New York, New York City, but didn't realize it. Uh, he was raised in the Caribbean until, until during the Civil War, his aunt said, you know, your parents are, were from New York. You're an American. He said, well, if I'm an American and there's a war going on to, to flee, to, then, the, then the purpose of the war is, is to free uh, Black slaves, and I should be involved in it. So he returned to the United States, joined the Navy, served on board the USS Vanderbilt and uh, had some adventures after the war in Central America where he learned uh, nursing and patient care and ended up in San Francisco and then in Sacramento. Because he had military experience, he very rapidly became a member of the, the Sacramento Zoovs and then its captain. And he established a business as a chiropodist, the foot doctor, which later became a family dis uh, business. Uh, one of his uh, daughters, Maud Flood. I'm not sure whether or not there's a, a relationship to the, the, the uh, Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood, the teacher from the 1850s, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility. And uh, while he remarried while he was in Sacramento 
Animeda Hires, who had toured the country on her own and was pretty famous and remarkable woman in her own right as the half of the Hire Sisters, who were a Black opera troupe uh, led by their father and uh, retired to Sacramento after the death of her sister. Uh, other leaders in this community were folks like Sarah Mildred Jones, a black school teacher who came to Sacramento in the late 19th century. And she was the first principal of Sacramento's first integrated elementary school, Fremont Primary at 24th and N Street. And she retired in 1914. After her appointment, a group of Sacramento student school teachers and um, people whose kids were in Sacramento schools sent in a letter to the school board saying, you know, she should be removed. Why should we have a, a black principal in Sacramento? And a group of about five times as many community leaders and educators and parents said, well, you know, we, we already settled this half a century ago, right? When we said that to J.B. Sanders said, yes, your school deserves to be funded. Uh, so no, shut up. <laughs> she's a good teacher and she's a great leader and she'll make a great principal, which she did for, did for 20 years. So Sacramento's black community, uh, this is Shiloh Baptist Church, was still fairly small, still only about 1% of the population, it's a Shiloh Baptist congregation. So a community this small was described by historian Clarence Caesar as the, the settled period, where there weren't the large existential threats of slavery, but the population, this population was too small to really make much of an impact. There was not really much of a, a professional middle class. And it was a small population that was outnumbered by nearly every other group in Sacramento. So they just kind of kept their heads down for the most part. But during this era, the 19 teens, heads kind of had to pop back up in response to social threats. This is the J Reverend J. Gordon McPherson, founder of the uh, 1906 Sac the Sacramento Forum, which was the first black newspaper in Sacramento. There were several of these uh, newspapers around this era. There are no, so far as I know, there are no copies of any of them except for one copy of a later paper called the Western Review, which was published by Reverend John M. Collins. And part of what drove some of the this crisis was a growing influence of the South and the growing influence of, in response in many ways to the aging and death of the generation that had fought the Civil War. And in the South, there was a lot of effort towards uh, that cultural hegemony I talked about in the beginning of the presentation and reinforcing the idea of white supremacy through things like dedication of statues to the Civil War. And a lot of them, the, you know, the lot of ones that uh, thankfully we're seeing torn down throughout the South in the past few years, the uh, statues of, of Southern generals or Southern soldiers were often, would often very have inscribed on the sides, this is dedicated uh, to the idea of white supremacy or that the white man should remain uh, in control of the South. And, and that message was starting to spread with the influence of, of new media and specifically a, a play called The Klansman, which was later turned into a motion picture best known as Birth of a Nation. And between 1908 and 1915, Sacramento's African-American community dealt several times with theatrical productions of the Klansmen based on a novel by Thomas Dixon Jr. about reconstruction in the South and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Featuring heroic portrayals of Klansmen and shocking sinister characters, caricatures of African-Americans usually portrayed by white actors in blackface, productions of the Klansmen were protested in many cities. When the Klansmen was produced in Sacramento at the Clooney Theater, uh, in November of 1908, Sacramento's African-American congregations discussed raising formal objections or attempting to have the play canceled, but decided against a formal objection. Newspaper accounts attempted to minimize the racism of the play by pointing out that the production had much in it of historical interest to the younger members of the race, and claiming that, in the Sacramento Union's view, protests in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles against the play have not done the Afro-American race any good. The small size of Sacramento's Black community meant that meaningful protest was difficult without sufficient organization. Now, in 1910, the play returned to the Clooney and was met with limited local protest, but these protesters' efforts were not sufficient to prevent the performance of the play. 
In 1911, when the Klansmen came to the Diepenbrock Theater on J Street, seen here in this photo, Reverend R. H. Herring of St. Andrew's AME filed an emph emphatic protest with Sacramento Mayor Marshall Beard against the production. By this time, several southern and eastern cities had suppressed the play due to concerns about race riots. In the words of Reverend Herring, I cannot condemn too strongly the production of this play of the Klansmen. Everything that is cruel and despicable against the Negro race has been brought out and introduced in the drama. The Negro is shown as something a little lower than beasts, and in all fairness, we think that we are within our rights in asking the city to help us in this matter. I think we've suffered enough in the past without having this highly overdrawn picture of one-time conditions of the South thrust upon us without uttering a word of protest. We love peace. Our people in Sacramento are hardworking, law-abiding citizens and taxpayers. We're not asking much, and we would like to see this prejudiced drama substituted with something more wholesome and true to life. I'll see Mayor Beard, who I am sure is a friend to our people and fair-minded, to learn if something cannot be done to convince the management of the theater deep in Brock that the play should not be given. Now, note that that very deeply diplomatic language of this letter is really trying uh, to basically to supplicate and to say, please, because this isn't a group that has enough political power to say, say much more than that. But while they didn't get the response they wanted, they did say something. And despite Reverend Herring's appeal, Herring's appeal Mayor Beard was unmoved and Diepenbrock put on its performance of the Klansmen. The Union Reviewer reported the, reported the local Black community felt the play didn't represent conditions in the South and did them an intolerable injustice, but went on to describe the intense drama, merry comedy, and gripping action of the play and its realistic depiction of settings like the Great Cave of the Ku Klux. In 1915, the Klansmen returned in a new form as a feature-length motion picture produced by D.W. Griffith and known as The Birth of a Nation. Due to the growing political experience and organization of Sacramento's Black community, by this time, their response was larger and more direct. Commissioner Ed Carragher, on the left, was visited by a delegation of 24 men and women instead of just a single pastor. By this time, even Governor Hiram Johnson, previously credited with endorsing the film, had retreated from that position, stating that he'd, he'd never improved the work and always thought it could be productive only for prejudice and ill feeling. This time, the protest was met with a limited concession from the city commissioners. The film could be shown, but in edited form with the most objectionable scenes removed. The edited film was met with sub subdued enthusiasm by local media. Even this minor concession, given the context of the times, represented a victory in an era of rising prejudice. In the pages of the Western Review, Reverend Collins heralded the community's position as an earnest and, man and manly stand. Now, another uh, black leader of Sacramento during this era was P.J. Glyde Randall. He was an attorney. He only briefly lived in Sacramento. And I don't think he actually heard any cases here. So uh, many of you are more familiar um, with Nathaniel Colley as the first uh, lawyer, black lawyer in Sacramento. He's the first one who actually heard cases. But Mr. Randall was, uh, he, he made a kind of splash, even though he wasn't here for very long. And he provided a list in 1910 of Sacramento's black leaders such as Robert Herring of St. Andrews, who we mentioned was the, set, had sent the letter to, to Mayor Beard, and John M. Collins of Shiloh, uh, employees at the state capitol, Robert Fletcher, who we talked about, uh, Walker and White, owner of a barber and shoe sign stand at uh, 7th Street, Frank Butler, J.S. J. Serrett, Harry Moss Maidzu, who owned a restaurant at 3rd and L, G.W. Hayes, uh, D. Williams, uh, Gwyn's Tamale Parlor, Ernest Russell, William Stepp, and then a group called the Douglas Impro Improvement Club at 209 L Street, uh, run by Grant Cross and William Snow. We're going to talk more about them later. But first, uh, one thing as a historian that historians tend to like is a unique name. Harry Moss Maidzu. That's not a name you run across every day. And it's a lot easier to find a Moss Maidzu and track them than someone with a more common name. It turns out that Harry Moss Maidzu was the son of Kuninosuke Masumizu, who, uh, along with uh, some other immigrants from Japan, were the first Japanese settlement in the United States. Uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, up in, in, I think, I keep mixing it up, whether it's in El Dorado County or Placer County, so please correct me, but the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Farm uh, in the Sacramento foothills, 
which didn't last for very long, but some of the migrants from Japan stayed. And the case of Kuninosuke Masumizu, he met uh, a woman by the name of Carrie Wilson, African-American, who lived in Coloma. And we talked a little bit about Black agriculture. There were limited amounts of Black-owned farms in El Dorado County. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually in 2020, I was contacted by the descendant of some of these families. And there are still a few descendants out there of this, uh, this, this community, which I don't know enough about yet. And I hope to write about, but their, their child used the last name Masmeizu and moved back to Sacramento. And supposedly some of their descendants are still in Stockton. The Frederick Douglass Society, uh, there was a African-American men's club founded by Grant Cross and William Snow. And uh, so those of you who've read Wicked Sacramento or some of my talks about the, the West End Club heard a little bit about Grant Cross and William Snow. This is one of the only photos of Grant Cross, a.k.a. Skewball, that I was able to find. And he was born in Illinois. His family moved over, had come originally from the South uh, after, after slavery, stayed for a while in Kansas, for a while around Stockton, and uh, he moved to Sacramento in 1900 after uh, spending a stretch in um, Red Bluff, which he found very, very boring, I understand. And um, Grant Cross, it's kind of hard to tie down. Um, he was mostly, mostly worked as, as a laborer, as a waiter, as a bartender, but he was also a community leader. He was somebody that every, knew everybody and everybody knew him. He was written, written, written up in the paper as he was just a figure that everybody knows, but nobody knows him now or very few. That's one of the reasons I wanted to write about him because he be, became this very engaging leadership figure, the, uh, um, someone who had a, a gift with words and with language. Um, and even to some extent that I'm able to tell with what's called code switching, where depending on his audience, his language, his intonation, uh, the, the terms he used would change, uh, whether it's addressing, say, a white audience or a black audience. Uh, William Snow, born in Texas, uh, was a professional gambler. Both of them loved to gamble, um, although William Snow, I don't think he actually never actually got, got arrested for gambling in Sacramento while um, skewball um, Grant Cross actually was arrested a few times. Uh, this arrest record is the only photo I was able to find of William Snow uh, from a human who is a manager of the organization we talked about, the, the Frederick Douglass Society, which was later renamed the West End Club and the Eureka Club. Uh, in 1915, there, there, was, there was a customer who started throwing pool balls at people. And uh, Snow went over to break up the to, to, to calm down this guy throwing pool balls at everyone and the guy wound up to throw a pool ball at Snow who pulled out a pistol and shot him in the arm. He was arrest, arrested for shooting the guy in the arm but the guy didn't press charges because well it, it did resolve the situation. And their organization was set up to be a parallel to a group, an organization like the Sutter Club. And the Sutter Club, of course, uh, for those of you who are longtime Sacramentans, is a was was established in the 1880s as a men's club uh, to promote business and fellowship, and uh, basically, it's it, in a lot of ways uh, to to run the city. And it was a whites only club, so this new club, the West End Club, was intended for black men to play the same role as fellowship and community, a place to relax and have a drink or play a game, but also a place to connect, a place to create this kind of civic institution and organization uh, outside the realm of some of the groups we looked at earlier. So some, a lot of the leaders we talked about are teachers and church leaders uh, and reverends and very much respectable parts of the community. Uh, the, what, what these folks were, they were business people. And in, in the business of selling liquor and, and entertainment, and, and they, in many ways, these were the people who brought a new, mu a new music to Sacramento, born in New Orleans and named in San Francisco. The first band to bear the name, a jazz band, was the San Francisco band. And uh, San Francisco is just, just down the road. And generally, if you're traveling east or west, to, then you, you pass through Sacramento. And one of the things that got this group in a lot of hot water was when young white kids, especially white women, started showing up at black sponsored dancers dances at different community centers in town like this one, a former church, a sixth and L Street um, called Sarah, Sarah Hall, 
which for a while was a, a Yugoslav community center, but also was one of the, the headquarters for the West End Club after they lost their, their previous location here at 209 L Street, just down the street from Harry Must Made Zoo's restaurant at 219. And um, this place, actually, the, the, the city council and the police uh, gave them quite a bit of brief, grief for the fact, the fact that white kids and white women kept showing up to check out this new kind of music. And that struggle continued at their next headquarters, Churchill Dance Hall, which was on M Street between 4th and 5th. And it was owned by John Churchill, who was described as a professor. But there really weren't any institutions of higher education in Sacramento. But uh, it should be noted that professor was also a euphemism at the time used for uh, someone who played piano in a brothel. And this, this part of town did have a lot of brothels. Uh, he had his own family band and the Churchill Dance Hall was open to this new type of music and also this new civic organization, the West End Club. It became another one of their headquarters. And in 1914, it was also a, uh, a voting center. It was, it was, the, it was the, the voting, the polling place for this neighborhood for the West End, which in addition to being the black neighborhood was also the heart of the city of Japantown and Chinatown. Uh, the Mexican community in Sacramento was based there along L Street, so a multicultural neighborhood. And this was where, for those who were um, citizens, and as, as many of you know, if you were a Chinese and Jap or a Japanese immigrant, you weren't allowed even to apply for citizenship if you were considered an alien ineligible for citizenship. So many of the voters, most of the voters in the West End in this neighborhood were the Black voters. Again, the folks had been organized by groups like the Sacramento Zoovs. And the women's civic, the 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 I'm oh, sorry, the uh, women's Christian Temperance Union, the uh, anti-drinking organization that would, has growing in power in the late 19th century, and were part of the progressive movement that actually helped uh, get prohibition passed. And a few years later, said that this Churchill Dance Hall was a terrible place for a. Uh, a polling place and so the this the county registrar should remove it and not allow voting there and there was in the summer of 1914 a meeting held at churchill dance hall at which uh, all of the local candidates office for office were invited and the article about this in the sacramento union is one of the most uncomfortable things to read just because of the characterization of the the way that the uh, black voters and even the black musicians playing music there are are portrayed in the article and but the thing to think about at this point, this is the same time that their polling place is being threatened. If you are a black voter in Sacramento and you can't vote at a place like Churchill Dance Hall, it means you have to walk considerably farther east into the white part of town where people will very clearly, very, very quickly let you know that you're not welcome in order to carry out your civic responsibility of voting. And so the message they were trying to deliver garbled by the the political reporting in the sacramento union at the time was that um this is our place this is our voting place and if we, we want we want our political power we're a political organization and we want to provide our backing for a candidate that will support our right to vote but as i mentioned the black and tan faction of the republican party was losing the Lily Whites were winning, and the progressives were less interested in racial issues than their than their predecessors in the Republican Party. Their next headquarters came uh, in 1915 at the corner of Fourth and L Street, above the Nippon Theater, a Japanese-owned movie theater, and performance space, which had previously been a Japanese boarding house, but was rented to the West End Club. Now, during the 1880s, 1890s, starting with uh, the very small settlements like the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Farm, uh, Sacramento very rapidly became one of the fastest growing Japan towns on the West Coast. It wasn't the largest in the country, but proportionally, in terms of percentage of population, Sacramento is one of the most Japanese cities in the United States in terms of that. So it had a, a large population connected to Japanese owned farms in the region and owned again because uh, they were uh, aliens ineligible for citizenship. 
uh, Japanese immigrants were not allowed to own land in California. Sometimes they could get lands uh, owned in their children's name because their children were born here. They were automatic. They were citizens. But those connections between Japanese farms in the in the hinterlands and Japanese businesses downtown became parallels to uh, black farms, as we mentioned in El Dorado County and black businesses downtown. And the, they became neighbors, allies. These are often parallel worlds. You didn't necessarily go to each other's churches or each other's restaurants or each other's businesses, but you couldn't help but be neighbors. And because the white community kind of hated everybody that lived there, you sort of ended up on the same side. At the same time, Sacramento is growing geographically. And our first suburb, Oak Park, emerged in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, to the southeast of Sacramento and outside the city limits. And that was one of its great advertisements. No city taxes. That also meant no city services. So no city sewers, no city water, no city police or fire. But they did offer a cable car. Well, not a cable car. They were originally going to have a cable car. But cable cars that kind of were pioneered in San Francisco and by then being used all over the country, actually physically pulled by a cable, were logistically a challenge and physically expensive. So they tried something new, an electric streetcar powered by a battery and charged by a steam engine here at this uh, base of operations at 28th and M Street. Part of the building is still there. And... Uh, the, the problem is that the batteries didn't work very well, so they only used the batteries for a couple of months before they replaced it with mule-drawn streetcars. And from the late 19th, early 20th century, after a, a bit of a, a bobble is that in that uh, Oak Park was laid out and platted out in the 1888, and uh, 1893 was a massive economic depression with the Panic of 93. And uh, Edwin Alsip, the developer, he's uh, the fellow with the, uh, the, the mustache and the soul patch there uh, in the middle, uh, standing to the left of the woman. He uh, signed over all his property to his wife in the, about 1885 and disappeared and was never seen again. Uh, but he did start Oak Park. And that what's now McClatchy Park was originally just called Oak Park. And it was more of a scenic area and where there was a bit of an oak grove next to this farm that he was developing. And when he bought a, a lot in Oak Park, you just bought a piece of land, as I mentioned, no sewer, no water, uh, not even a paved street, but you could build whatever you wanted. And by the early 1900s, there, uh, Oak Park had its own celebrities. This is Lavery Cooper, AKA Charmian, the strong woman, uh, athlete of remarkable physical strength and agility and a star of vaudeville who uh, had plenty of merch produced to the point where it's still available online today. Uh, it's owned electric streetcar systems. Once the electric overhead was perfected, um, they ran electric wires out to Oak Park and uh, its own electric carnival, Joyland. And the nice thing about Joyland is not only did it have these wonderful electric rides and you could ride there on an electric streetcar, but you could also learn about uh, the joys of having electricity in your home. And just coincidentally, Sacramento Electric Gas and Railway owned the streetcar line. They owned controlling interest in the development company and they own interest in Joyland. And you kind of have this interlocking series of companies that sells people rides to and from work, sells people land and then sells people electricity. It was a profitable business model. And by the early 1900s, the um, community of Oak Park, especially around 19, 1910, 1915, after annexation to the city of Sacramento, which was driven by Oak Park, the largest suburb of Sacramento and the most working class with the most to gain by having access to city water and city sewer and city police and fire and other services. Um, and then Oak Park also had no, um, not, had, did not yet have what were called racial covenants. Racial covenants were introduced, again, this era of ascending racism, 1910 to 1920, was uh, the, the first era that American suburbs started to require that you had to be white in order to buy property there. Oak Park didn't have that. And so folks like the, this young man, uh, Ernie, Ernesto Galarza, 
who later grew up to be a labor leader in his own right, who was one of the major influences on uh, folks like Cesar Chavez. When his family had enough money to move out of the old West End, they bought a house in Oak Park. And some Sacramento, of Sacramento's oldest suburban developments did not have racial covenants. Boulevard Park, located where the old racetrack was between 20th and 22nd Street, had covenants, codes, and restrictions, but they were had to do with the size and scale of buildings, not about race. And there was at least one black buyer of an early lot in, in Boulevard Park, and he wasn't restricted from doing so, so they sold it to him. There was a Chinese man who tried to buy, and apparently some folks in the neighborhood tried to convince him, that ended up convincing him not to buy. I do not know and, and do not care to guess what methods were used to do so. But subsequent suburbs, in fact, most of them from about the 19 teens through really the 1950s, almost all had racial covenants with very few exceptions, uh, such as the Eichler track in the early 1950s. Eichler wouldn't let racial covenants be used. But that meant that Sacramento suburbs were more and more, the new parts of town were more and more cut off from the communities of color. Uh, another leader that, that emerged in this era was the son of Isaiah Dunlap, uh, who was in the middle there, who was a member of the Sacramento Zouaves. And his son, George, from an early age, had a talent for cooking. And he cooked for his family from the time he was in the fourth grade, had to drop out of school, uh, worked part-time moving vegetables around for a Chinese grocery vendor south of, of Y Street, the old, the old uh, public market there. And he worked for Southern Pacific on their dining cars, not just on the, the regular passenger train dining cars. His skill was such that he was promoted to what were called the private cars. And private cars were what Southern Pacific executive used to go around the country. And he actually, he lost his job with Southern Pacific in 1919, just before national prohibition, when some states were dry. He was accused of smuggling whiskey from California to the state of Washington. He was acquitted because the, um, the arraignment said that he was trying to smuggle it into Oregon. And of course that was legal, but it, it did mark the end of his Southern Pacific career, but he found other employment. And um, as I mentioned, there wasn't really a professional class. There were, you know, lim very, uh, other than Captain Fletcher, a chiropodist and uh, a few other community leaders, there weren't, really a, there weren't really a whole lot of businessmen, but as a restaurant owner and an entrepreneur, George Dunlap was definitely in that spectrum of, of the, the small black little middle class in Sacramento. He also, for a while, operated the dining concessions on Sacramento Northern Railroad, which ran between San Francisco and Sacramento and Chico. But he lost that concession after Western Pacific Railroad bought the railroad and wanted to use their own concessionaires. But he did have a house and he did have some daughters. And so he decided, well, uh, I have this house in, in Oak Park. Again, no racial restrictions. He bought the land in 1906 and built the house over the course of the next year or so. And in 1930, opened Dunlap's dining room. Uh, another. Uh, black resident of Oak Park who made a lot of changes in a short time was Reverend T. Allen Harvey. He came to Sacramento from San Jose in about 1915, was briefly uh, the pastor at uh, St. Andrews. He founded Sacramento's chapter, first chapter of the NAACP. He won the first civil rights lawsuit in Sacramento for, for, um, in Oak Park but when a restaurant failed to serve him. And he founded the first suburban black church in, in Sacramento, Kyle's Temple AME Zion. He also became the first African-American to run for city council in 1920 and 1921. And uh, one of the weirder stories is that uh, his church, Kyle's Temple AME Zion, uh, there was briefly a uh, chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in 1922 in Sacramento. And the closest thing to an act of terror they did is they painted Kyle's Temple AME Zion. They didn't vandalize it. They didn't burn it down. They painted it. Why? Because they wanted to shame uh, they wanted to shame uh, T Reverend T. Allen Harvey for some reason. I thought painting his church would do it. It's, it's rather odd. And now this was another thing that happened in Oak Park uh, at the Muddocks building. Uh, uh, 
on 35th Street and 4th and uh, 5th Avenue. And uh, unbeknownst to the people attending this meeting, the Sacramento Bee had a, um, a reporter hiding in the bushes across the street, re recording everybody who went into the building. And they published as many names and with people they could recognize in the newspapers, partially because uh, the owners of the Sacramento Bee were Irish and Catholic. And the city, city manager of Sacramento, Clyde Seavey, Irish and Catholic, and uh, had no love for the Klan. Now, this didn't stop uh, the Sacramento Bee from publishing Valentine McClatchy's anti-Japanese racial screeds uh, in the Sacramento Bee. But uh, to an extent, the Sacramento Bee became a, a, an ally to the Black community because of a shared common interest, uh, uh, opposing the Ku Klux Klan. And, and uh, again, the, the enemy of my enemy and my, is my friend, I think, was the position taken. Uh, now, another thing about T. L. Reverend T. Allen Harvey is he was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. And before Black troops had gone to fight in the First World War, he spoke to them on what war was like and what they were likely to experience. And then he talked to a group of Black veterans after the war in 1919 during Red Summer and formed an organization called the Crispus Attic Soldiers and Sailors Club, nominally as a group for veterans to meet uh, and be part of their community and do civic things. Uh, but in a lot of ways, this was a paramilitary organization. Uh, like the Zouavs. I don't know a whole lot more than just the name and a few announcements, but it was very definitely in response to Red Summer. And this was something that happened uh, in, commun in Black communities throughout the nation, is people, uh, the, the people in Black communities made informal or formal efforts to organize and arm themselves, to defend themselves against race riots, against lynching, and against the horrendous amount of violence that was happening. And uh, so far as I know, there weren't any of those of the, those activities carried out carried out here in California. There were incidents in San Francisco, but none in Sacramento that I'm aware of. And whether Crispus Attic Soldiers and Sailors Club could take any credit for it, I don't know. It's another organization I don't know much about yet. But that closes out this chapter. And as I mentioned, this was what um, Clarence Caesar called uh, the settled community. This wasn't an era of great victories. It was an era of small victories. Small businesses existed and continued to exist. Minor victories were held. Small advances in organization representing a small community of color in Sacramento. Uh, and the, the emphasis, the focus was on survival and survive they did. And But th those roots were now half a century old and they continued towards the next generation when greater steps was taken. And this is part three. The third era, the 1950s and 60s. And this is an era that many of us are, are more familiar with, either personally, personally familiar with because we were still alive when these events happened or because uh, many of these figures are people that we learned about in school or via media. And also with the increasing involvement of women and increase, increasing uh, penetration into the social consciousness through media and through representation uh, as elected officials or high government officials. Uh, even, even the Supreme Court, the color line had been breached and, and the United States Congress. But at the time, of course, uh, like the leaders of the previous generations, many of these people were, were reviled, were hated, were uh, lied about and became uh, victims of hate and prejudice and in some cases became, sorry. Let's step to take a step back uh, before the 1950s and 60s or the 1940s. And um, well, another crime perpetrated against a community of color in the United States was Executive Order 9066, which imprisons Japanese Americans on the West Coast, and in many cases who lost their property and homes on very little notice. And this became, also became an opportunity in many ways for African Americans and represented a fundamental shift in cities like Sacramento, because 
the Japanese American community, as I mentioned, was was very large and played a large role in local industry, local agriculture. And that was a void that needed filling and the need for labor in a city like Sacramento, which played a pivotal role in transportation, in canning, in in agriculture and in regional transportation and regional movement of goods to the Pacific theater of war uh, meant uh, influx of African-Americans and became part of a wave of black migrations that had happened following the civil war and in, in, in the 20th century, which usually resulted in a significant growth of flowering of black communities throughout the country. But the places where they could move were limited. And in Sacramento, uh, this is a map from the 1930s. Many of you may be familiar if you've been reading about redlining the past few years, a uh, redlining map. And generally, um, uh, the spots that were red were either spots of heavy industry or uh, communities of color and considered terrible for banks to loan money to. All right, need to find my place. Uh, these are the owners of the Zandabar Cafe, which was located at 6th and M Street. And it was previously a Japanese owned liquor store. And it became an icon of West End jazz and a home away from home for African-American soldiers serving at Sacramento's military bases. It was owned by Louise and Isaac Anderson on the right. And then their business partner, William Nitz Jackson on the left. Nitz, Nitz was his nickname and located at 530 Capitol Avenue. Now, Jackson was born in Oakland in 1910, but Sacramento resident uh, since 1929. Graduate of Sacramento City College, who worked as a postal carrier prior, prior to establishing the Zanzibar. Uh, due to his colorful style and his outgoing personality, Jackson quickly became the public face of the Zanzibar, uh, a little bit like, uh, like Skewball at the, um, the West End Club, and also provided the club's unique revolving stage, which is adapted from a piece of surplus equipment from the nearby Sacramento Army Signal Depot. Now, the Andersons had moved to Sacramento in 1924, and they were struck by the diversity of the West End. As Louise Anderson told the Sacramento Observer, I used to go to town, you wouldn't see a black face. You'd see Hindus in their turbans, Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, and a few Mexicans. You didn't see many whites. Black people lived in the lower end due to the fact that you couldn't buy anywhere that they wanted. Some of the best people lived there, too. Now, due to discrimination, Isaac Anderson was able to, unable to find a job on the police force, despite having been a police officer in their hometown, or even a job at night watchman. He instead worked for the city of Sacramento in the maintenance department. We talked a little bit about culture um, and, and about black servicemen. Now, there were two Army Air Corps bases in Sacramento, out in the suburbs, Mather and McClellan. McClellan... Um, was the Black Air Force Base, and that's the, the way it's been described, and Mather was the White Air Force Base in terms of the, the workforces that were there. And because McClellan was kind of out in the middle of nowhere at the time, Sacramento was the hub for entertainment and recreation. And so clubs like the Zanzibar were where they went, both during the war and afterwards and uh, became pretty legendary. Here you can see that circular stage, uh, rotated stage. They said it was a surplus piece of radar gear, but radar was very, very new during World War II, so it might have been some other kind of uh, rotating equipment or revolving equipment, I'm not really sure. Um, and then the kind of music that you heard there, this was not a giant club. As you saw, this was basically an old house that someone had built a new ground floor. So this is more along the lines of um, not so much a big band jazz because you really couldn't fit like a giant 12 person, 20 person orchestra into the, the Zanzibar's little revolving stage that you can see right there. But it was good for uh, a small combo. So uh, some of the, the more um, Latin jazz and even some of this kind of more experimental bop jazz or soloists or, or small groups uh, and more the kind of uh, sitting there and, and listening type of jazz is what you'd hear at the Zanzibar. And also it was also known for, it, for its dinners. Uh, local musicians played there too uh, in, the, in addition to national stars. And uh, when Sacramento got the attention of national stars uh, like Joe Lewis and came to Sacramento, wanted to go to the, the coolest jazz club in town. They took him to the Zanzibar. And then to the right is uh, um, 
Hubby Moore of the Momo Club, which is the other coolest bar in town. It was local, the, the coolest jazz nightclub in town. It was directly across the street from the Zanzibar. We talked a little bit about the uh, Churchill Club at um, Fourth, Fourth and Capitol. And Churchill's building, with uh, the previous uh, polling center and uh, West End Club headquarters for a time, had switch transition to becoming a Japanese American boarding house. But again, uh, the Japanese American family was interned and they had to sell. And the purchaser was a woman by the name of Benny Twig. And she maintained the property as a rooming house. You can see there's rooms for rent here, but she also opened a beauty parlor in the, in the ground floor. And she also opened a record shop, which was in Sacramento in the one of the first places in the early 50s where you could buy what were then called race records later better known as rock and roll and then she also op opened a cab company because she noticed that if you were black you could not get a cab in sacramento so she opened a black owned ca a cab company so again becoming part of this small sacramento black main street uh essentially reutilizing the spaces which had up until just a few months previous have been the heart of japantown uh, after the war ended, Sacramento was kind of a, a crowded place as the Japanese American community returned, the African American community was already there, and people kind of had to shove their way back into a neighborhood which was becoming close, but because it was redlined, it was very, very difficult to actually reinvest, and a few people did, that there were actually new buildings built. Uh, new homes and uh, new businesses, but they all had to be self-financed or would have to use smaller pots of money that, that were available to uh, to white America. The NAACP had its own credit union. There were a few Japanese American banks based in Sacramento that extended loans. There were even a couple of very early subdivisions that were d designed uh, for Black customers in Sacramento. Uh, J.R. Smith was a, a real estate broker who built some of these subdivisions, and they're still trying to figure out exactly where they are, mostly probably south of Sacramento for the most part, or to the northeast. Uh, and uh, Sacramento, at this point, the early 1950s, 1951, was when this article was published in a magazine called California, which is basically a Black interest version of Sunset Magazine, uh, these small suburban subdivisions were forming both in the south of the city and to the north of the city uh, near McClellan Air Force Base. During the war, there was a small colony, essentially the families of African-American workers there that made use of improvised materials. Uh, the, the apocryphal story is that they used crates that planes had been shipped in to the Air Force Base, it's old, just scrap wood to build homes. And they called it Splinter City because of the, the, the low quality of the wood. But the, so they, they built with what they had and what they could. And the, the name stuck so much that even in the late 1950s and 1960s, the enlisted men's recreation hall at McClellan was called Splinter City. And the booker there, a Japanese American woman uh, by the name of Marian Achita, but she's told me a lot of stories about booking bands like Martha and the Vandellas or Ike and Tina Turner to play at Splinter City at McClellan. And so these social institutions that are emerging are still based on the foundations of the old ones. The Sacramento NAACP, Shallow Baptist Church, St. Andrew's AME, they all survived. They all, they all continued uh, still in the West End, and, and new institutions were being built. A&J Liquors was a liquor store that was opened by, uh, by, Isaac, by the Andersons and uh, was around even after the Zanzibar was closed down alongside Japanese American businesses that moved into new locations in the old Japantown, uh, where, wherever they could. Yorozu dry, suit, dry Goods previously in a different location in Japantown, but after the war opened in this location. The, the sign actually moved uh, post redevelopment to a spot south of, Broad, uh, south of Broadway on Riverside, and it's currently, I believe it's in the collection of the Center, Center for Sacramento History. Uh, Nitz Jackson, uh, teamed up with a, a Japanese American attorney and uh, opened the Congo Club at Third and Capital. And uh, Nathaniel Colley, 
who had married a, a young woman from Sacramento, moved to Sacramento and became Sacramento's first practicing African-American attorney. And the civil rights movement, again, the, this era that we're coming into the 1950s now, uh, there's a lot of focus on this emerging black middle class, emerging black professionals. A lot of it's still very much uh, tied up in the, uh, the idea of respectability of an established community, uh, seeking acceptance, seeking um, that they just been basically just fought a war ostensibly against uh, this horrendously racist group, uh, the Nazis, uh, and came back to a, a nation that said it stood for freedom, but put them in segregated uh, military quarters throughout the course of the war. And they came back to cities, even in California, ostensibly not a state that had Jim Crow laws, but still segregated. And this was, this was unacceptable. Even its public facilities, uh, the new housing project of New Helvetia was built in 1940. It was a Works Progress Administration, a depression, the Depression era project, and used after the war as veterans housing, was, except for two buildings, closed to people of color. And Nathaniel Colley, one of his earliest court cases in Sacramento, was integrating New Helvetia. And uh, as, wherever possible, the members of this community decided they were going to make their own institutions. And Felix Flowers, uh, who was a member of the, the Elks, but the white uh, owned uh, the white Elks building downtown wouldn't let the, the black members of the Elks organization meet in their hall. So he said, well, um, I'm going to go ahead and build my own building, open a restaurant called the Flower Garden and use that as our Elks Lodge. And uh, it's, it's actually still around today. It, the restaurant only lasted a few years. It was taken over, it was purchased by Sacramento's Japanese American Citizens League. And because it had clubhouse facilities for a fraternal organization, it became the meeting space for a new Nisei Veterans of Foreign Wars chapter, who like the Elks had been told by the white VFW chapters, they did not want Japanese American veterans meeting in their space. So I said, well, we're just gonna have our own. But when it was still, the, uh, the flower garden, they had local entertainers uh, like the Rovers, uh, local 50s uh, proto rock and roll, proto uh, rhythm, rhythm and blues vocal group performed there. And it's still around today. Uh, segregation was apparent, but the, the, the strength of this community to thrive despite segregation was also apparent. In the middle of this, uh, this photo, the, the three-story building that you see here, there is the Catalina Hotel. It's owned by a Mexican immigrant by the name of Catalina Harrow. And her claim to fame that she told just about everybody who came into the hotel was that when Duke Ellington came to Sacramento to perform on the, the main stage at the Senator Hotel, he couldn't get a room there, but he stayed at her place. And then in front of the Catalina Hotel, cherry blossoms a Hanami line, a representation of Japanese culture in Sacramento in this multicultural neighborhood. The old Zanzibar was reopened uh, as the Paradise Steakhouse by uh, another young entrepreneur um, who, um, who purchased, the, the purchased the building uh, after the closure of the Zanzibar and tried to give some of the same vibe to it, but it didn't quite work out because in the early 1950s, uh, redevelopment appeared in what had previously been this very vibrant, very lively, uh, if very much in need of investment, part of the city. And the term blight, uh, it's, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again, it's an imaginary disease of buildings. It comes from botany, but essentially the idea, as we talked about with redlining, is that in order to justify the expense of demolishing, uh, acquiring and demolishing buildings, uh, they had to be declared blighted, which doesn't mean they're a slum. It means they're likely to become a slum, largely because of the color of the people in the buildings. And there had been plans to redo Sacramento's grand entrance between the M Street Bridge, later the Tower Bridge, and the California State Capitol. There was this Depression era plan to turn to create a great park and promenade there's no mention at all of where the people who used to live there might go, let alone that they'd ever been there. And then in the 1950s, a redevelopment plan 
which uh, would still replace the entire neighborhood physically, but included a certain amount of housing because up until 1954, redevelopment plans had to include housing for the people who had been there. Uh, and then at 4th and I Street, a part of the city, a part of the, the street that would dip down to Sacramento's original street level and it would have three restaurants, a Chinese restaurant, a Japanese restaurant, and a Mexican restaurant as small compensation for destroying the neighborhoods of, of all of these communities. Apparently, they couldn't find even room for a soul food restaurant in that. Um, so aside from those token appearances, again, no representation for that community. Then in 1954, a new version of redevelopment, the businessman's version of redevelopment, no longer required replacement of the buildings of the homes within the same redevelopment zone. You could redevelop from residences into business land, for example, and not need to replace. You had to have kind of a plan for where people would go, but it was mostly left to the, the market forces would take over and that the, the free market would provide enough housing somewhere. Uh, but where? If you're in a black community, uh, then you have, if, you, if you're a person of color, there's not a whole lot of places that you could buy. And the places that do allow, that, that, that don't have racial covenants are limited in number. Uh, but the characterizations made to justify redevelopment were very much focused on the, the worst blocks in the neighborhood and media propaganda was based very much on stoking racial fears and the assumption that the people who don't want redevelopment are just blind to the, the problems of the city which you can see the, the giant obviously dark-skinned person personifying those problems so what or what is someone going to what lesson is someone looking at this picture going to take away about who's causing the problems of the city and how they could be solved. In the meantime, Sacramento's crusading attorney, Nathaniel Colley, is trying to create more space for black business. And uh, one of the, th the, the, the his clients was a tile, tile setter by the name of A. Bacon, who uh, had tried to join the tile setters union so he could work as a tile setter, but because the tile setters weren't, union was whites only, they wouldn't let him join. So he couldn't even work at his own trade. And in the meantime, while they're trying to settle this lawsuit, Nathaniel Colley suggested to Mr. Bacon that he start his own tile company, which he did. He actually, it was so successful that even after he won the suit, he said, well, I'm a contractor. I'm making better money doing jobs uh, in this neighborhood uh, than, uh, than I would be just working as a tile setter and being a member of the, the union that doesn't want me. So uh, he continued in this role. And very often when I see tile from the 50s in downtown Sacramento, I wonder if that's Bacon tile or not. And there are only a handful of color photos in this neighborhood. In contrast, the photo we're looking at right now with that photo of, the, of Skid Row that I showed just a few minutes ago, a color photo says a lot more to a contemporary audience. We tend to think of the idea that the past is in black and white. But a color photo looks like now. It looks like something we could see if we walked to 6th and M Street today. And this is what the, the West End actually looked like when this photo was taken. And just a few, few years later, the owner of the drugstore was putting up signs uh, while their celebrations for the beginning of redevelopment are being held across the street. They say, you may be next. Now, this is a land grab. And despite protests and protestations, the West End fell. But our story doesn't end there because, of course, <laughs> the people who were in these communities relocated. They took their properties, their social institutions, and moved them somewhere else and started again. In this case, St. Andrew's AME moved to Southside Park, where it still is today on 8th Street, across from the park. Shallow Baptist Church moved from 6th and O Street to Oak Park in a church designed by Sacramento's first African-American attorney, James Dodd, and built largely through the labor of its congregation. The Women's Civic Improvement Club uh, women's organization started in the 30s as a community organization, but also intended to provide housing for single Black women. Uh, its first first base, <coughs> sorry, at 19th and T Street still exists. Its second home seen here, the old uh, 
I think the the old uh, mansion of, the, of what was called the Bean King, a Portuguese farmer who uh, made a lot of money farming beans. And right behind, you could just see a bit of it to the left there, uh, the old National Guard armory was a, a massive 20 room mansion where the Women's Civic Improvement Club held social functions as well as uh, housing for a couple of dozen young women. And it was demolished for freeway, for the freeway, Highway 50 that came through in the 60s. But the WCIC also relocated to Oak Park, where it still exists today. This is a, it's a 1960s building with, I believe, a 1990s addition to it. And many of the other institutions, including the business institutions, the Momo Club, the Paradise Club that we talked about, uh, the, the, the next step of the, the Zanzibar's journey, relocated to Stockton Boulevard. And uh, the civil rights movement uh, continued to amplify and was embraced by, by the uh, white establishment to some extent to the, and to the Democratic Party. This is also the era we um, we talked a little bit about the Republican Party and the transition of the abandonment of black voters. This is the era when Democrats had finally started to embrace civil rights in the 50s and 60s. And so uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, Governor Brown uh, were hand in hand with Sacramento's black leaders. And at the same time, the Republican Party was embracing what was called the Southern Strategy, where they more, more fully released the civil rights mantle to the Democratic Party in the, with the hopes of pursuing uh, longtime white Southern Democrats to join the Republican Party. Uh, social institutions like the Sacramento Observer, a newspaper by, by William Lee, which started out in the West End and relocated to Oak Park, but that, um, became in many ways the, the public face of Oak Park and the black community. And cultural shifts happening in the 60s tended to happen in proximity to black cultural centers, to black neighborhoods. And Sally Niguez, who previously had worked in an accountant at McClellan Air Force Base, opened a beatnik coffee shop, if not one of the first, if not the first in Sacramento, one of the first which became a cultural hub for the funk art movement, for the experimental musicians of UC Davis's uh, growing music department, the uh, artistic hub of the region located roughly between CSUS and Sacramento City College. It became the spot where if, because figure studies were not allowed at, at Sacramento City College, you couldn't paint a nude, the figure studies classes were held at the Belmonte Gallery. Uh, but it also became where Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other civil rights groups met in the 1960s, along with other uh, Black organizations, other civil rights organizations in Oak Park. So the, that cultural flowering was coming out of Oak Park. At the same time, changes are happening on the state level. Uh, Byron Rumford got the Rumford Vera Housing Act passed in 1963, but the following year, a statewide proposition supported by the California Association of Realtors said, well, no, we're, we're still going to allow racial covenants. The Rumford Fair Housing Act can't go into effect because of the will of California voters. And it overwhelmingly passed. And the idea of Rumford was to get rid of racial covenants and get rid of redlining. But it was too profitable for reasons we're, we're going to hear about in a few minutes. And also, we talked about highway construction. <clears throat> Highways were being utilized not only to allow faster access to the city center and downtown and um, facilitate the growth of far off suburbs. They were also used in many ways as de facto Berlin walls. Uh, this is Highway 99, just south of Broadway. You can see broad Broadway in the foreground, separating Oak Park from Curtis Park. And of course, there's some bits of Oak Park which are on both sides. Uh, but Highway 50, Highway 99, uh, Business 80, these became bulwarks between Black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And we're going to hear a few video segments by, and interviews by Ginger Rutland. Please, if you cannot hear the audio, let me know because I'll have to restart the video. 35th Street, Oak Park, once a bustling shopping center, now a burned out shell, symbol of a ghetto. I'm Ginger Rutland, KCRA News, and I'll be taking a fresh look at Oak Park, my old neighborhood. <laughs> 
What happened to Oak Park? You were here when it happened, and I, I'd like an explanation. Well, I'm part of the um, influx of uh, blacks from the West End during the, um, when, when Third Street was, uh, and, and the West End was redeveloped. And um, I feel that because of the designated um, um, efforts from the, rede the uh, re um, uh, Real Estate Association, in those years, this was part of what I call the beginning of the destruction of Oak Park. And um, I feel that whatever has happened to Oak Park, that was the seed planted. And uh, what exactly did they do? They, they designated? Well, when, uh, when people were being replaced in, in the uh, around second, third, um, in, the, in the West End, I was on, on across the street from our Crocker's Art Gallery when we came to Sacramento in 1942 when they started designating uh, where people were going to go in order to have them get out of the way, they designated blacks to Oak Park. And of course, if you look for a house, you were, were told that they, there was no place they could put you except um, Oak Park. So you, or quite a number of us were geared toward Oak Park because we wanted a decent place to live. Oak Park was a beautiful place at that time. And people were moved in here overnight there was an effort to block bust this this really happened because i worked out here um in the early years of uh, sacramento i worked on 12th avenue 11th avenue 33rd i caught the trolley out here I brought my baby to well baby clinics which is um at uh, mcgeorge's law school now and uh, this is how the wholesale destruction of oak park started you know um <clears throat> and once we once the blacks started to come in here i believe Roy Taylor was on the corner of third, uh, 33rd and, and 6th Avenue. Beautiful store there. Even Roy Taylor was frightened and moved out of here wholesale once the blacks, and he's on Stockton, uh, he's on uh, Freeport Boulevard now. What happened to the white people? When the blacks moved in, what happened well, to the white people? <clears throat> there were efforts, and I think this can be substantiated, it, to put it bluntly, Ginger. Well, there were quite a few old Italian families and all out here, and the niggas are coming, so you better... You better get before you would fumigate and sterilize a house before you'd um, have a family move out. But I actually saw people move in in this area overnight during that time. And with all this fear, the blacks, uh, the, the whites moved out. People who had beautiful backyards with, with roses, who had fruits. Um, they had built those, uh, uh, planted those, uh, those the, the yards and gardens for a lifetime. And they were frightened and they sold the property and they got out of here. And consequently, blacks also have the same middle class concept. When the whites started moving out, quite a few of the blacks decided, you know, this is, we, we're going to have all the people from second and third. You know, blacks don't all associate e together either. Now that uh, testimony, that interview was with Blanche Hill, who's a community leader of the, of, the, of the times. And she mentioned a couple terms I want to uh, talk about a little bit. She mentioned the term blockbusting and that this neighborhood had been designated. Blockbusting is a term that was used by our realtors. Uh, part of why realtors opposed the Rumford Fair Housing Act is because they had a business model. Uh, and blockbusting was one of the terms used for it because black customers could only buy in certain areas and there was a limited supply, that constrained supply meant that realtors could charge a higher price to a black customer than a white customer. And if they were able to convince people in a white neighborhood like Oak Park, which again was not entirely white of course, but it was predominantly white. And if they were able to convince white people in a neighborhood that was unrestricted, that it was becoming a black neighborhood that was a signal that property values were going to plummet precipitously because, of course, redlining is still in effect. And if a neighborhood becomes a black neighborhood, then it becomes a higher credit risk. Property values goes, goes down and it's impossible to get loans. So they would sell at fire sale prices in order to get out of the neighborhood as fast as possible and relocate somewhere else, generally to the whites only suburbs farther out. Then the business, the business people, the, the realtors could purchase those properties at a low price and sell them at a high price to a black customer. We hear more about that from our, uh, the next video clip. What part does redlining play in the decline of Oak Park? I think one of the major uh, things that have occurred since redlining started is that some of your mortgage companies and local banks won't loan money into this community uh, so that people can, in fact, uh, 
repair their homes that need to be refurbished or in fact from their standpoint without question I don't think they've loaned any money in this area in the last 10 years um, I would think they would consider Oak Park being uh, a disaster area uh, an area that uh, no one wants to live in and I think one of the the project area committee's uh, objectives is to uh, improve this committee and I mean, improve this community uh, and we also have the uh, the option of using at the present time uh, uh, redevelopment agency for subsidized housing in this community but we're not getting any uh, monies coming in from our local loan loan uh, associations or banks and specifically banks in this community are not lending any money uh, for building now from that video he talked about the, the redevelopment agency now that was the same organization that had just destroyed the West End and kicked this community out but once the neighborhoods like Oak Park or North Sacramento became communities of color. They became the new red line neighborhoods. They became the new redevelopment areas. And because of changes in the law and essentially people noticing all of a sudden, maybe this redevelopment shouldn't entirely just be used to build commercial buildings. The business communities, oh no, you know, building commercial buildings is just fine. Uh, at least a little bit of the money started to trickle in towards redress and towards building uh, new housing in redevelopment areas, but it was a tiny proportion. And from what you heard, all, little to no private investment, because while Rumford has been passed and the Fair Housing Act federally has been passed in 1968, Redline was, was still in use until the early 1970s and banks still stayed away from these zones. One of the things that we encountered already twice is the idea of community self-defense, of civic organizations that are intended to defend the community from slavery and from racial violence. And that idea came back in the 1960s in Oakland, California, uh, personified in the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which its purpose was to cop watch, to patrol the streets of, the, of their city and their community and to ensure that police brutality didn't happen. And they were there armed legally because open carry of firearms was legal in California um, to keep an eye on, on power. And when a, the Mulford Act, which, would have, which banned open carry in California, was heard at the California State Capitol, the Panthers came to Sacramento. And that had a huge impact on the national stage. And Black Panther Party chapters formed throughout the country, including Sacramento. At the same time, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., about the same, the same time, spoke here in Sacramento. And you're about to see two clips of uh, Dr. King in Sacramento and then of Eldridge Cleaver. And we talked a little bit before about this sort of the, there's the first half and the second half of each movement where the first half it tends to be more formal, more structured, more uh, tends to wear a nicer suit, maybe. And the second half, more radical, more... Uh, Ask, asking for more and, and more directly. But I want to talk about it is just as necessary for the concerned person and the person of goodwill to condemn the intolerable conditions which continue to exist in our society, which cause individuals to feel that they have no, no other alternative but to engage in violence in order to call attention to their problem. But after all, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and democracy have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, humanity, and equality. And I have a special little word for Raul Reagan in the morning. Fuck you, Ronnie Baby. Yeah!
believe that Ronald Reagan is a punk, a sissy, and a coward, and I challenge him to a duel. I challenge the punk to a duel to the death, and he can choose his own weapons. Could be a, a gun, a knife, or a marshmallow, and I beat him to death with a marshmallow. Now, the terms and language used by those two speakers is different, but the message is the same. If, there, if people feel like there is no alternative to defend their communities and their lives but revolutionary action, that's the path that they'll take. And that was the, the, the path of the Panthers. Locally, the Black Panther Party set up their headquarters on 35th Street, just down the street from the, uh, the two theaters in Oak Park. And locally, uh, an artist by the name of Akinsanya Kambon, born Mark Teamer, a uh, Vietnam veteran, and what became known as um, the Black Panther Party Lieutenant of Communications, drew what uh, was known as the Black Panther Coloring Book, and provided a lot of graphics and illustrations for the Black Panther Party, which was very active here in Sacramento. And any Panther that you speak to, there's still a, quite a few members uh, from those days who are around today. Anyone that you interview, whether they talk about what they're proudest about was their free breakfast program, which was very much present here in Oak Park at the uh, at Oak Park's headquarters. And that was uh, that, and uh, some of their other programs were inspirational to to other communities. Not only the the revolutionary aspect of it, the educational aspect of it, but the social aspect of it. And uh, they felt like that this was they had to matter. To their community in order to justify their existence and rather than being an organization of the professional class uh and a development of the, of the black middle class and the, the the lawyers and the pastors and the doctors and professionals of the emergent black middle class this is a working class expression and also a revolutionary expression and that provoked a disproportionate response from Sacramento police who raided Black Panther Party headquarters on June 16th, 1969, known as the Father's Day riot. And you can see, here's another news clip of the aftermath of that incident in Sacramento. Well, you know what you're saying, yeah, but what you're saying though, you see, is, uh, and I want you to see that there ain't no bullet holes at all. Now, if, if rifle fire had came out of that door. building there, that there door, should there should be holes somewhere over here. Unless they're using blanks. If a bullet had came through that door, uh, one of the policemen would have been dead because they had to shoot that. And at that close range, they were standing right down the sidewalk. And if we had been shooting at those cats, one of them would have been dead with a rifle. That's right. I stood to the door. I asked the cop to uh, let me take the sister to, to the hospital. And the dog said he didn't want nobody to come out the building. And when I turned around to walk back in and tell everybody to. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you can you give me some reaction to what you've seen here right now? Well, I can only tell you I think I'm a little shocked and horrified. At what, sir? At the condition of these quarters. And what, what are your plans right now? Well, I don't have any specific plans. We've uh, just completed a meeting. We are now uh, examining uh, what has happened and seeing with our own eyes uh, uh, the shambles that was created here. And uh, I am certain that the council in its next uh, regularly scheduled meeting or perhaps even a special meeting uh, will get further into these matters and in this sense uh, hopefully come up with some what are called in today's world uh, meaningful solutions. Is we can't continue this. It, it, can, it, it must not happen. It just must not happen. It's uh, going to show the people that they're doing something that they've never done before rather than sit around and uh, listen to uh, other rhetoric. Uh, other people saying that what has happened, and they take a stand on what has happened. From, Are you uh, satisfied that this is uh, what you say concern? 
No, I'm not satisfied. Uh, just because they see it don't mean they're going to work on it. This young man was right to not be satisfied. Um, despite Mayor Richard Marriott's words about meaningful solutions, there was no conclusive settlement or resolution to the uh, raid of the Black Panther Party headquarters. Uh, it also spurred the closure of many Oak Park businesses and nearby the place, nearby buildings in the communities, including uh, Clarence Azevedo, former mayor of Sacramento, uh, closed his women's clothing shop. And despite having stood up for the communities of the West End when he resigned from the redevelopment agency after their vote to demolish the West End. Uh, the following year, in May 2nd, 1970, police approached a group of young people listening to amplified music in McClatchy Park, threatened them at gunpoint, and chased them out of the park. Later that evening, Officer Bernard Bennett, uninvolved with the earlier incident but patrolling the same area, was struck in the head by a bullet fired from an unknown location. Accompanying Officer Lloyd Smothers reported the shot may have come from the direction of Black Panther headquarters, while other neighborhood accounts claim it came from the tower of the Oak Park Fire Station on 4th Avenue. Police scoured the neighborhood in pursuit of the shooter, but to no avail. Officer Bennett died four days later. On May 13th, Sacramento officials announced the arrest of seven young men, including two Black Panthers, artist Mark Teamer, who we discussed, and Jack Strivers, and two former presidents of the Sacramento City College Black Student Union, Booker T. Cook and Dale McKinney. Four of the seven, Teamer, Strivers, Cook, and Sierra Cook Cabrillo, and another BSU member, were arraigned and became known as the Oak Park Four. Over the course of the trial, the defense attorneys paid by the Oak Park Community Legal Defense Fund scrutinized the city's case against the four young men. The police's star witness was Lamont Rose, originally one of the seven arrested and the first released. Rose was the only one who was not a black militant and had an extensive criminal record, calling into question the veracity of his testimony. Another prosecution witness, Joseph Ramey, recanted his testimony, claiming it was coerced at gunpoint, with the police offering $5,000 and a trip back to his hometown of Chicago if he cooperated. Another witness, Kenneth Diagre, also recanted, claiming he was told that if he did not witness, he did not testify, he would be arrested for conspiracy. A final witness, Lee Hawkins, refused to testify at all. Facing the collapse of the case, with no physical evidence and no witnesses except Lamont Rose, the district attorney moved to abandon the case. Joseph, Judge Joseph D. Cristoforo dismissed the charges against the Oak Park Four on January 28, 1971, ending an eight-month ordeal although Cook was held longer due to bank robbery charges. Applied even though Cook bore no resemblance to the bank robbery suspect, but purportedly added to, to strengthen the conspiracy case. The end result of the three summers of conflict and combat in Oak Park was a turning point. The community wanted justice for murdered Officer Bennett, but they're horrified by a police response that treated all Black Sacramentans as responsible for the crime. Problems with the prosecution were well known within the community, but Sacramento media ignored them, leading to a difference in perception by the bulk of the city's population. The four accused young men were all militants, but they were also talented and educated young men, college students, artists, and organizers. Their values were a new generation's reflection of the earlier generation of activists who are now the established black middle class, and the crisis helped mend the rift that had formed between them. Uh, the incident also raised the issues of police brutality, a uh, lack of minority police officers and city council members to a greater level. The issue of police brutality did not come to a head until later in the 70s. And because the trail was allowed to grow cold during the intervening eight months, uh, there was never any re resolution. Nobody to this day knows who killed Officer Bennett. Oak Park maintained this community and, and retained uh, its activism. Uh, Benny Twig, who had originally owned that building on the West End, she relocated her beauty parlor to Oak Park, to Broadway and 36, which that, the same building became the um, Oak Park Center for Afro-American Thought in the 1970s. And uh, Milton McGee in 1968 became the first African-American uh, elected to Sacramento City Council. And he actually came within about 800 votes of being elected mayor. There were also influences by other organizations and communities. Uh, the Chicano movement in many ways was, was in, influenced by the labor movement of Cesar Chavez. And we talk a little bit about uh, his influences here in Sacramento. And, um, and um, the Chicano movement was also inspired by the civil rights movement. And the Black Panther Party inspired, for example, the Brown Berets in Los Angeles. And locally, the Royal Chicano Air Force, which was a local 
arts group, but also involved in politics, involved in community organizing, based their Breakfast for Ninos program on the uh, <laughs> on the free breakfast program that the Panthers held. So these these all of these social movements, all of these actions uh, influenced people, including the the gay rights movement. The Oak Park Methodist became the meeting location for um, a small new organization called um, the Americans for Responsible Citizenship, which was founded by a young man named Rick Stokes, who came to Sacramento in 1961. Um, at the, with the real, real, he came to the realization that it no longer could deny that he, he was gay. He was born in Oklahoma actually had himself institutionalized because of his homosexuality and uh, decided in 1960 when he met David Clayton from who was from Sacramento, uh, fell in love and moved to David's hometown and his home church in Oak Park. Uh, they formed a group called uh, Americans for Responsible Citizenship because in the early 60s, gay rights organizations couldn't talk about what they were really about. They had to couch themselves in euphemism. And that gay rights movement, again, claimed its heritage from the civil rights movement. And one of the first protests for gay rights in California, before Stonewall, uh, before the Black Cat, before, um, or uh, about this uh, contemporaneous, even with, uh, with some of the, the earliest public gay rights protests was a fight at the state fair. Not a fight, but uh, a protest because Americans for Responsible Citizenship had wanted to have a booth in the, the great state fair hall with uh, thousands of other civic organizations, they were denied. So instead of being one of thousands of tables, they decided they were gonna stand out in front of the state fairgrounds and hand their pamphlets to everybody, uh, reaching a, a far wider audience. Uh, this kind of brings us to the, the close. We're right at two hours, and I'm sorry I've gone over a little bit, but I'll uh, end the screen share. And uh, I'll go ahead and, uh, and open up the floor to questions, then maybe make a few closing statements if we've got a minute. So um, are there any questions? I, I saw there, there were a few comments in the chat, but I didn't get to see them because of the presentation was up. I think there, there was one comment in the chat. Um, I think there was a slip of the tongue. You said the Native American party earlier, but I think you meant the nativist party. No, no, they were there. The name of their party was the Native American party. Oh, that's confusing. Okay. Yeah, but, <laughs> but also known as the Know Nothing party. And yeah. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah. And then I think uh, David had mentioned he was canvassing um, in Hel uh, New Helvetia a few weeks ago. Um, but I don't think we right have on any questions uh, in the chat besides those. So if anyone has any more, feel free. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for taking the time. Um, and I apologize for the state of my room behind me. I just moved a couple of weeks ago. So I'm kind of still getting, getting organized. And, um, and I think that I wanted to, I'm really glad I got to do this because I wanted to put some of these, uh, some of the things I've talked about in other presentations into a broader historical context and talk about how this connects to the civil rights movements throughout the United States. And uh, we tend, very often we'll tend to think of, of Sacramento as, as not playing a role in larger history and local history isn't the same as the, the kind of history that we hear about on the national stage, but there's, there's, all, there's always connections between them and, and between the, these eras. And while a lot of the the structures we're, play, we're placing here, like the idea of the, that it happens every 50 years or that there are these two waves. These are my interpretations, but the, they're open to other interpretations as well. So thanks everyone for, for being here. I just want to mention uh, what a few people are saying in the chat. Um, thank you so much for presenting this. This was very comprehensive. Um, Maddie, do you want to, are you going to say something? Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was very comprehensive. Uh, everyone who's here, I will send out a copy of this recording to you. It will be posted on YouTube, but I'll send everyone that was here the link. Um, please share it with whoever you'd like. Uh, and yeah.
Okay. Um, I'll just give a, a, a brief plug on um, Sunday, June 5th at noon. We're still working out exactly. We, now we, we finally work, we've nailed down the when. We don't quite know the where. Uh, there's going to be a walking tour of Oak Park that will involve, we're going to have nine different signs. We're doing, we're doing signage at some of the places that we talked about today, like Black Panther Party headquarters, especially for places where there isn't a building. We're going to, going to do a foam core sign with a historic photo and some text interpreting the, 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 what happened there stories that haven't been told or aren't as well known and each one will have a qr code and a phone number and an email seeking feedback and we're going to do this walking tour talking about a little beyond the what's what's on the tour but part what mostly we want to do is we want to get feedback for the signs and with that feedback from the community we're going to make uh actually installed metal signs in those in those locations so we can tell that broader story of oak park history as that um and just a little bit of what we talked about today Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks again for attending.